Let's open with prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful tonight to be here. We're so thankful for all the things that you've provided and enabled us to have. Lord, remember our brothers and sisters uh, who are in other places tonight and under less favorable circumstances. And we uh, ask prayer for them. And thank you for uh, Lord, just providing us this beautiful place to worship. Thank you for your word, for the truth that's in it. And Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts tonight in this hour. And I ask as well that our fellowship with Christ Jesus and one another will be very sweet. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. 403, 403, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ Arise.
Well, good evening to you, and uh, happy halfway through the week. Boy, the weeks go fast, don't they? There is a balloon there. Mr. Kevin, what are you doing with that balloon there? That's ridiculous, man. You can't be playing with that during church. That's You're out of line. You're out of... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there's Uncle Tim. What else do you see? Anything else in here? He didn't, she, didn't, he didn't see, she didn't see people. Oh, glove. Okay. All right. I'll try to make the... Let, let me make the announcements, Aria. All right? Okay. She's announcing a lot of things. What she say? Don't touch this. Don't touch that. That's one of our announcements. I want to make sure to let folks know. We've been experimenting with making cages in here, and uh, we got brother, brother Lee over there, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna make one for the Gibbonese, I think up here up front, uh, Lord willing, so they could be here on Sunday. But if you're watching us online, you say I, I don't see a way that I could come to church and uh, and be isolated in a way that would be safe but still be able to be there uh, come talk to me about it we'll see if we can accommodate you somehow see if we can make a way that uh, you could do it and uh, we've thought about a lot of different things and uh, truthfully if we'd thought it through months ago we'd have done something we you know did anybody know how long this was going to last anybody here uh, think oh i think this is going to last this long yeah well, you know, we can, it doesn't really matter whether it's lasting a long time because of decisions people have made, how it's been handled. The fact is it's lasting. It's, it's still, we're still dealing with it. We still have folks that aren't able to be here, and we still have infections that are going around and individuals that it would be very harmful to, to be infected. And so that's a reality. So if we can help with, if we can help you and accommodate you to be able to come here safely, Come talk to us, and we'll make up. We'll make something. It's it's far more important to have you here uh, than it is to not have things, you know, be the way we wish they could be. We wish we could all just come in and you know do a Renee, hug everybody, and and uh, have a have a good time and all that. But that's not reality for us right now, and so we'll accept the second best. And that that brings up the important thing that's coming up. We we have scheduled revival services for the week of August the 9th through 14th. Dustin Duke is going to be with us, and we are really looking forward to being able to just have some preaching and to be able to have a time when God is moving in our midst. And God will meet with us during that week if we're prepared for Him to. How can we prepare? Well, God mostly doesn't do things that we don't ask Him to do. You know, so many times God has said, Ask of me. Ask according to my will. Pray. Ask me anything. And God tells us to ask for things. And uh, sometimes we wonder, well, you know, if God, God wants to do it, why doesn't He do it? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I want to do that I can't do without your permission. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, there, you might want to do something for somebody, but if they don't really want you to do it, you can't very much. You ever want to help somebody and just seem like they didn't want to be helped? You know, that's the way it is with God and us many times. God wants to bless us. God wants to forgive us. God wants to use us. But we've got to ask. And so... Uh, let's pray that God will work in our in our lives individually and as a church. And then uh, plan. Plan to be here for all the services. Uh, I've tried to give you some, some warning uh, in advance. It's still a couple of weeks off. And so for some of you, none of you, you never plan anything that far out anyway. And so it's some advance warning. So plan. Plan to be here. That means that if you normally would be doing something on one of those nights of the week, which I assume everybody here does something all the time, right? Obviously, you're going to have to plan uh, to be part of the revival services instead of that. So make plans. Maybe get things done in advance. Maybe cancel some things for the greater priority. So plan for it. And then uh, invite, invite folks to come. Invite people that you maybe haven't been in church for a while. Invite friends that um, that you're praying for. Are you praying for your friends? Have people that you know that you're praying for? Invite them to come to the revival services. Um, and 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 then when you invite them, go ahead and pull the favor. Ask the favor. 
you ever done a lot for somebody or you've you've built up goodwill with someone because of things that you've done for them or because of a relationship and you feel like man I would never want to ask somebody to do something for me well maybe you could ask them to do something for them for you does that make sense in other words it would just mean a whole lot to me if you'd come to church and hear the preacher well I don't really about it would you just do it for me would you do it for me uh, you know uh, I have I don't know how many friends of mine got saved because a girl invited him to church. But a lot. You know why a guy went to church? Because <laughs> a girl invited him. I'm telling you, I probably know hundreds of people that got saved because some girl invited him to come to youth group or invited him to come to church, and they went because a girl asked him to. And conversely, girls have gotten saved because guys invited him to church. So I'm not saying... You know, well, if that's the scenario, go ahead and, and go for it, guys. But, um, <laughs> but there's there's got to be somebody that that would do something for you because of a relationship that you have. Ask them to come to to the revival services for that, and tell them I've, I you know I prayed that you'd come. I'm asking you to come, and I'm hoping that you know that I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, God works in your life. When you come, be forthright about it. You'd be amazed at what God has done. I have seen planned revival services. I have seen things that people prayed for for years come to fruition during those services. I was just a, uh, a few weeks ago talking to Pastor McClure, and he was telling me about Jeff Boer, a man in our church in, in uh, Delray Beach. His wife, Ann Boer, is a member of our church and prayed for her husband for years to be saved. And... For her sake, actually, he came to help us fix the sound system one night, and we tag-teamed him. I said, would you please come? And she said, would you please come? And he came, and Dr. Bill Rice preached one of the clearest messages on assurance of salvation, and Jeff got saved. And I just heard the other day about how he's growing, how he's doing, you know. Um, a guy in our, in our uh, one of our teenagers' dads, uh, Michael Vanelli, uh, came to church on a on a Wednesday night because his son invited him and he got under conviction he can't remember sitting in after the end of the revival service after the gospel was preached he came forward and you know he had a lot of religion in his background it took a long time for him to understand that he needed to be born again but he got I remember the night he got saved I remember one of our teenagers brother Johnson Glaude his uh, one of his close friends his next door neighbor JJ uh, Johnson had been inviting him, and he came during evangelistic services that Dave Young preached. And J.J. got saved. I could just go on and on and on and on and tell you about people that I know whose friends prayed for them, and they came to a week of scheduled meetings, and their friends got saved. And let's pray that God does that, and let's pray for revival for ourselves. I'd, love to, I'd like to feel good, wouldn't you? Doesn't it feel good when you have new life and you're in relationship with God? And I'd just like to have that, uh, that wonderful freshness of being in a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the main thing I want to mention by way of announcement. Be nice to Brother Matt for a little bit longer. Uh, we've only got him a few weeks, folks. And, uh, man, you know, he's he's got to leave. He's got to finish his school. And um, got two years of school left. We want him to come back. So be really nice to him. Show up for choir practice for crying out loud. He's been trying to have a choir practice with you every Sunday evening at 515. Y'all don't show up, and he's just like, they don't like me, Pastor. They don't care. They don't want to have music. They, they hate me. And I was like, Matt, it's not true. They just, they're forgetful. They're just forgetful. They'll be here this Sunday, Brother Matt, 515 choir practice. We'd like to have something that we could do for the revival services, and it would be nice, but we really can't do it without people and so please come and participate in that we're going to take up our regular wednesday evening offering and i'm going to ask brother andrew to come at this time and prepare for that and we'll ask the lord to bless it now father thank you for the privilege of worshiping you through giving and i just ask that you bless the offering tonight and lord that you would meet the needs of this ministry with it we pray in jesus name amen
375 will be our final hand. 375, I gave my life for thee. Second Kings chapter 3. Second Kings chapter 3. And this is a night that you could be reminded about how helpful it is to know your books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. What? Oh, Ruth. Is that what you said? Joshua, Judges, Ruth? What's next? First, Second Samuel. First and Second Kings. That's good. Glad you guys know that. You all don't know if I know it now or not, do you? I, I never forgot that Joshua judged Ruth. I, uh, that'll stick with me even when I've got dementia, I'm pretty sure. It's coming on, too. So, but you can tell, the last thing that happens, I, I probably shouldn't, um, yeah, I was, I was going to make a joke, and it probably would have been funny, but, you know, some things can just be taken the wrong way. So, Chapter 3. Hey, Tashi. I'm glad to see you. Yeah, good. I'm not going to tell my joke. It probably wouldn't have offended anybody, but um, maybe it would. That's sort of like, but it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. But uh, you better know your ABCs because she's checking. All right, she'll give you the quiz. And the LMNOP have got to be done right. So let's look at verse 13. Have you found 2 Kings chapter 3? I want to read verse 13, and uh, hopefully it will be intriguing enough to you that you'll want to be into the story of it, and we'll cover that in our message. Verse 13, And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. I want to read that statement that Elisha said in verse 13. He said, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. The king of Israel said unto him, Nay, but the, for the Lord 
hath called these three the kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Father, I pray that you would help us to see our need for revival. From the example in Scripture here tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I want to preach for the next couple of weeks uh, on Wednesday evenings, if the Lord allows it, on the subject of revival. Kind of a, uh, my goal would be this. I would like us to understand what revival is, what we could hope for individually and as a church. I'd like to answer those questions. You know, there's a dictionary definition. I'm a Webster's 1828 dictionary. I believe that our English language was at its strongest point in the 1600s. And uh, really, uh, when Webster wrote his dictionary in the 1800s, 1828, uh, that's when the English language had really become its own language, not just a conglomeration of uh, Latin, Greek, and uh, different uh, based Anglo uh, based languages, but the English language, particularly Biblical English, which American English really had assimilated itself to. American English was never Elizabethan and never was British. Uh, American English, our founding fathers deliberately, uh, when they founded our nation, made the decision to break off from the other countries and they chose English as a language because that was the the uh, language in which the best version of the Bible, best translation of the Bible was in, was in the English language. We had our uh, King James Version of the Scripture, and they knew that because of the philosophy behind the translation of it, as well as the scholarship behind it, and the texts that were used to translate it, they knew it was the best Bible. And so even though we had Spanish, strong Spanish cultural, strong French culture, strong German culture, and of course Swedish, and we, even though we were already a melting pot of the nations when the United States declared its independence, when our founding fathers decided that they wanted to have a language, they wanted Americans to all speak the language, same language, so that we would be unified as a nation, they decided on the King James English language. And Noah Webster wrote his dictionary, translated his dictionary, used defining words as they're used in the King James Bible. And so I'm a Noah's, Noah Webster's dictionary definition guy because I preach from the King James Bible. I, I'm sorry about that. I think that's this one. There we go. Uh, I preach from the King James Bible. And so when I'm using words and terms, uh, the, I, I use Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. Here's four Four, uh, four statements that Noah Webster used to define revival. He said, revival is return, recall, or recovery to life from death or apparent death as the revival of a drowned person. You say, Pastor, revival, coming back from the dead? Well, yes, actually, and that's actually spiritually a possibility. You ever read James when he said, faith without works is dead? You know, it's not non-existent, and actually faith can be revived. Assuming the person who is faithless or has dead faith is alive physically, their faith can come back from the dead. Revival is coming back from the dead. There is a such thing as a believer in Jesus Christ, a born-again, saved person, being dead spiritually. By dead, I do not mean dead in their trespasses and sins, but I mean dead to spiritual things. Dead spiritually. That's what, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is expressly talking about it when it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Paul was not talking about lost people. A lot of times I've heard people say a lost person can't understand the Bible because, you know, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. No, actually, 1 Corinthians was written to the church where? What? Corinth. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for being alive tonight. Okay, so written to the church at Corinth. And I need Josiah here. Josiah would have answered that really quickly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was written to the church at Corinth. And a church is what? 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 A body of believers. Paul didn't write the letter to the church about lost people, but he said to them, he said, you guys are spiritually dead. 
and that's what he was talking about from chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so when he said that they were that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, he wasn't writing about unsaved people. He was writing about unspirit-filled, unspiritual believers. And that's why we talk about revival in terms of the church. Because as a church, we can be dead. As a church, we can be dead. You ever gone to church and just, your takeaway is we're dead or they're dead? Uh, it's just it's a dead church. And, you know, before the last people darken the doors, usually a church has already died. Usually a death has already arrived in it. I remember some years ago going to the First Baptist Church of Tallahassee, downtown Tallahassee, on a Sunday morning because I was passing through. And the church I was trying to make it to, I, I didn't make it. And I went to their worship service, and they had a contemporary worship service. And, I mean, they were working hard, the people on the platform. They were rocking out. And I remember thinking, this is the most dead service I've ever been in in my life. Seriously, it was just dead. And there was one lady in barefoot on the front row because she, her shoes, she, she couldn't dance in her shoes very well. And she was, you know, doing the music thing. And then there, there was a band on the platform, a massive old church platform. There was a band just rocking out on the platform. And they made all of us in the congregation, hundreds of us were there, but it was, there probably was room for, you know, a couple of thousand. And I remember standing there with a congregation just really scattered out, and we're all just kind of like this. While there, on the, nobody knew the songs. It really wasn't conducive to singing along. It was music they'd written and were performing. And I just remember thinking, this is really dead. Then the pastor preached a sermon. <laughs> I remember the message. He preached a sermon on Pandora's box. Anybody know the story of Pandora's box? He didn't preach the Bible. He preached about Pandora's box, about all the evil things were locked in a box. And then, you know, Pandora's told, don't open the box. And somebody went out of the room. She opened the box and everything came out of it. And then he said, we are all like Pandora's boxes. In other words, he'd never actually read the Pandora's box story to know his bad stuff that came out of the box. He said, we are just full of good stuff waiting to be unlocked. And that was the sermon. I left there I, and I told Melissa, I said, I've never been in such a dead service in my life because God wasn't there. The Spirit of God just was not there. And it wasn't just me and my judgmental personality. And it was it just God wasn't there. It was dead. And anybody can be that way. Any one of us can be that way. So Noah Webster said that Revival, again, is a return, recall, recovery, life from death. Then he said, it is also a return or recall to activity from a state of languor as the revival of spirits. You ever sleep so much you don't feel like doing anything but sleep? You could. It attempts to active. <laughs> uh, you could wish that, but there's a such thing as too much sleep. There's a such thing as sleeping so much that you wake up and you're just like, I just want to sleep. And it's, it's really close to depression. Being depressed in that state are very, very close together. I've slept that much before without getting depressed. <laughs> when I was in college, we had, they still at the college have this thing called the Graf Center, but it doesn't mean what it did back then. It was very different. Back then, you weren't allowed to miss class at all, and you couldn't, if you were going to miss class, you couldn't stay in your dorm. And so uh, if you got... Um, sick, and you were sick enough to that you weren't you shouldn't go to class. In order to really weed out the pretenders from the I'm going to die of sickness, they made you go to the Graf Center. And when you went to the Graf Center, if if you checked in and you missed class, then you had to stay there for 24 hours, and you could not take your schoolwork with you. You had to sit 24 hours. I believe you could have a Bible. Uh, but you were you were told you can't do anything. There was no, there was nothing to watch, nothing to read, nothing to do. There was a very very sterile hospital looking room, and you went in and you slept there, and you were not allowed to leave for 24 hours. You were on lockdown for 24 hours, and if you were actually sick, and you still had a temperature or whatever, you weren't allowed to leave until you were well. So some people could be in the graph center for like a couple of weeks, and it literally was probably worse than jail in a lot of ways. They wanted to make sure you didn't play sick. 
But one of the things that I, you know, one of the things that you do when you're in a place like that, you know, you can only count the dots on the ceiling tile so long. And you can only amuse yourself and, you know, get up and do push-ups and work out, you know, do a jailhouse workout and that sort of thing and all the things you do while you're on lockdown. Then it's like, there's nothing to do. So you go to sleep and you wake up and what's there to do? Nothing. So you go back to sleep. And after about 12 hours of sleeping, you realize I could just sleep forever. You really, you just sleep forever. You literally go into a state of sleep. Friend, I feel like that's where the church is today. I'm talking about the saved church. I feel like the saved church right now is just asleep, where God's not, God's not doing any major thing through the church. I'm not saying individuals aren't doing okay. Individuals aren't, God's not reaching individuals and speaking to individuals' hearts. But God's not moving and working. God's plan is the church. And the church is in a state of slumber right now. Wouldn't you agree? I don't think it's just me imagining this. I've been looking around. I've been, I've been asking around, looking at other places, other churches. And we're in a state of sleep. And friend, a sleeping church is not the church that Jesus Christ wants it to be. Third definition Webster gave, recall, return, or recover from a state of neglect, oblivion, obscurity, or depression as the revival of letters or learning. Remember the Dark Ages? What came out of the Dark Ages? Well, scriptures got translated and people started reading them and there were revivals. Fourth definition, renewed and more active attention to religion and awakening of men to their spiritual concerns. Man, my friend, spiritually speaking, as a country, I've never seen it so bad. I've never seen evil uh, so blatant. I've never seen the reversal of morality, the calling of, of evil good and the calling of good evil to the degree that it is today. And that's not a problem. It's a diagnosis. It was, I'm not, it's a problem as it is, but it's not this, oh, this is what it is, and now there's no answer. No, what it is is a diagnosis that tells us we need revival. We need revival. Agreed? We need revival. And so um, the message I'm going to preach tonight and the message I'm going to preach next Wednesday evening they're not typical messages that I would preach. They're topical and they may be terrible, uh, as most topical messages I preach are. But I want us to look at an example of something in the Scripture here as you are in Second Kings chapter 3, this example of this individual, uh, Jehoram. Let's still look down at verse 1 and uh, really verses 1 through 3 at this man, Jehoram. And I want to just make a point this evening uh, that I hope will make that that I hope will make you hopeful. Verse one. Now Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria, the eighteenth year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah, and reigned twelve years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat which made Israel to sin, and he departed not therefrom. Let's read verse 4. And Mesha king of Moab was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and an hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And then we see that uh, if you were to read on down to where we've picked up this evening in verse 13, uh, Jehoram gets together with the king of Judah. So Israel is a divided nation. Ten of the tribes are under Jehoram, and two of the tribes of Judah are, are uh, under uh, Jehoshaphat. And also they have a relative, Edom, the descendants of Esau. And you were talking about that the other day, weren't you, Brother Daniel, about Edom. So Edom is mentioned here, the king of Edom. So there's three kings here. We, three kings from the Middle East, are uh, going to battle with Assyria, with the Assyrians. And so... Uh, the, or are going to battle against the Moabites. So the Moabites are rebelling, and the Syrians are sort of backing them up. And Je Jehoram is losing control of the region. Do you see how much the king of Moab had to pay him? A hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with wool. That was their tribute. 
Well, man, they stopped paying you your lambs and your rams and the wool, and all of a sudden that's going to cause a deficit in your economy and uh, less lamb chops, less ram chops, and less uh, wool blankets or something like that. Anyway, so it's a major commodities issue that they that they had. And but worse than that, the Moabites also relatives of Edom. Uh, they were wicked people, and when they came into when 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 they became independent, then all of a sudden they would uh, impose their own morality. And there's a lot of problems with this, but particularly if you're a king, you don't want to let go of areas that are under your rule. So these three kings get together, and um, look at verse verse um, nine. So the king of Israel and the king of Judah and the king of Egypt, Edom. Or so went, or they went, and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. So this is sort of like how we got manatees in Florida. The manatees came from the Indies. You, you know that manatees are not indigenous, and this whole idea of saving and protecting manatees, actually they're an invasive species, and we need a petition to be allowed to eat the manatees so that we can go back to original Florida's pristine condition. And I'm for eating all these invasive species. And we, uh, this, is, this is my political position on this, just so you know. Uh, but the, you know how manatees got to Florida? Uh, sailors from the Indies used to put pens behind their ships. And in order to have fresh meat while they traveled, a manatee could swim along after the ship, and then they could, they could just stop and eat them whenever they needed to. And that's how we ended up with uh, those ugly creatures from another country, uh, you know, wrecking boats and injuring people in our in our pristine waters of southeast Florida. All right, I, I'm I'm being light a little bit. I'm I'm not really serious about. Uh, I I don't really have an opinion about manatees. Well, this is what the kings of Israel and Edom and Judah were doing. They took their cattle along with them. Why? Well, because they didn't have a refrigerator, and so meat on the hoof was fresh. But the thing that you need when you have cattle, and the thing that you need when you have troops is food and water. And all of a sudden they get there. So they're, they're heading over to Moab. It's not going to be a problem to fight Moab as long as you're alive. The Moabites aren't a major force. But when you go there and all of a sudden there's no water, your cattle are going to die and your people are going to die and you're, you're going to die. You're seven days away and if all of a sudden you realize, okay, we're in trouble. We're out of water and we can't find any. How are you going to go home? And so now they're saying, Alas, verse 10, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. You know who they said did it? They said, The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. Now the king of Judah would have some heritage, some godly heritage. Jehoram is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. The most wicked kings that Israel ever had. The most godless, Baal-worshipping, rebellious, anti-God king ever. Ahab and Jezebel. And that's who Jehoram is. And the king of Moab are descendants of Esau and Ishmael who have profaned the birthright and have done some evil things to the Israelites. I'm sorry, the king of Edom. Same would be true of the, of the Moabites. So here's an ungodly league of three kings who acknowledge that they had a plan to get the Moabites back under control but their plan failed, and their assumption is God must have done this. Not Baal, not the God of the golden calf, not all the different idols, but the Lord God must have done this. And so they said, uh-oh, we're in trouble with God. Now Ahab wouldn't have done this, but, you know, Jehoram wasn't as bad as 
Ahab, he did put away the image of Baal. He'd put away Baal worship in Israel. So he wasn't like his father. And here's what he said, verse 11. He said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord? It's not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him. And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, this is verse 11, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Well, Jehoram would have known Elijah. Elijah called down fire that consumed the altar of Baal. Remember this? And he destroyed the, or consumed the altar when he challenged Baal. And, and he, Elijah prayed for a famine, for there not to rain. It didn't rain for three years. Elijah was the guy that his dad Ahab said, Are you the one that's troubled Israel? Elijah was famous. In the, and so when he said, well, there's Elisha, you know, and he poured water. In other words, he was Elijah's servant. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Edom went down to him. This is ironic if you read about Ahab and his attitude toward the prophets of God. These guys are like, let's go find the prophet. Let's, let's get some help. It's a neat story. In verse 13, this is, this is our text. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father. Who are the prophets of his father? Prophets of Baal, right? Go, go, go ask Baal. <laughs> and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Look at verse 10. The Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab! Exclamation point. Verse 13, this, the last phrase, For the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Now, I'm not going to give you a rosy story here, which is ultimately going to tell you that Jehoram had a revival and that all Israel turned to God as a result of this. But I want you to see something that moves God to work. There's something here in this story that we see that is about the character of God that moves God to work. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do we deserve revival? No. We shouldn't have ever been cold to begin with. Right? Does America deserve revival? No. no. America has had God's blessing, and it's her fault she's got problems today from turning away from God. Right. It's so, isn't it? And I want to ask another question. Can one person be responsible for us having nationwide revival? No. No, one person can't. You can't have revival without agreement. But you know one person can have revival. Now, we're going to see next week, we're going to see the difference between individual and corporate revival. We're going to see the difference between when one person uh, decides, hey, I want to be made alive again. I want to give you hope. You can have revival regardless of what anyone else does. You know, we could have a bunch of cold-hearted people show up to the revival services and glare at Brother Duke. Every time he says something, I know you're talking about me. And I'm not listening. You can do that. And we can have one person that's here and says, I want you to talk to me. And that person will get talked to by God. Now, that's, that's the hope of revival. But there's, there's individual revival. And, you know, um, individual revival uh, it can even be groups of individuals that want to just have it themselves. You know, we don't need, uh, we need revival personally. But we do. Could we agree that we need... <laughs> We need something bigger than just us. I mean, ultimately, wouldn't that be the goal? Whereas I want revival for me, but I want to see revival around me too. I want to see revival in our nation. I want God to move and work everywhere. Don't you? I, and we need that, don't we? Um, a revival isn't simply for the purpose of self-edification, though. I can have individual revival, and I need individual revival, but revival just for me really isn't good for much, actually. You ever wonder where monasteries and convents come from? They come from putting into action the idea that Peter blurted out when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
Remember that? Peter wakes up, he's asleep, he wakes up, and there's Jesus, and there's Moses, and there's Elias, and Jesus is in his glorified body, and Peter, James, and John are with Jesus there. What did Peter say? It's good for us to be here. Let's build, let's make tabernacles here, and let's just stay here. Man, this is great. Jesus, you're glorified as God. Moses and Elijah are here. This is just perfect. Let's just stay here. And hang the rest of the world that Jesus came to seek and to save. In other words, that's the idea of what happens. Uh, and, and it isn't actually true, but the, uh, it isn't true revival. But you ever wonder what a monastery is all about? Why would somebody withdraw from the world for spiritual benefits? Well, just so that they could have the feeling they're looking for. Why would you have a convent where you withdraw yourself? That doesn't make any sense at all. We're not talking about revival. I need to, you know, get on a higher level. You know, it'd be like the, uh, we went up to the monasteries when we were in Greece, went up to the monasteries in Meteora. And on the top of these sheer cliffs are these, I mean, just ridiculously high up, are just these buildings perched on top of a cliff where monks climb up to and nobody can get to them. And they can just sit there and withdraw themselves from the world and quote, you know, in this spiritual bliss or whatever. That isn't revival. That isn't the purpose of revival. It isn't for us to withdraw ourselves and be better than everybody else. But revival is so that we have life. And then we want that life to become more corporate. But I asked the question, I really just want to make this point tonight. We're actually almost out of time and it won't take very long to look at it. Uh, here's what Elijah did. Let, let me read this story, and then and then I'll tell you what the point was that I wanted to make. And you can be like, well, I didn't have the point, but the point's still a good point, whether you agree with, <laughs> with it being the point of this passage or not. Uh, and Elisha said, verse 14, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. <laughs> That's quite a statement, isn't it? I wouldn't even talk to you if Jehoshaphat weren't here, Jehoram. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Pause here, just a second, another side note. Isn't it interesting that Jehoshaphat didn't go to see Elisha? Isn't that interesting? Jehoshaphat's supposed to be a godly king. And he's not the one that said, let's go see Elijah. The ungodly king Jehoram said, the Lord's going to kill us. You got a prophet? Yeah, we got a guy, Elisha. You know, he used to pour hands on, on Elijah's, or pour water on Elijah's hands. Let's go see him. Okay. And they get there, and Jehoshaphat doesn't say, hey, Elisha, we're here because, no, Jehoram says, Elisha, we're here because the Lord's going to kill us. And Elisha said, you know what, I'd let God kill you if, it, if Jehoshaphat wasn't here. What a stinking scoundrel that Jehoshaphat is to be there, though. You ever think about that? He's, what kind of a spiritual leader is he? You know, revival probably isn't going to come from the person that everybody thinks is going to bring it. The person that has the most truth. The person that, uh, you know, has the, the, the spiritual position. You know, sometimes revival comes because somebody that's just a mess needs it. And that's Jehoram. So verse 16, and he said, This is Elisha, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also in your hand. And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward, and stood in the border. 
And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. The end result is everything that Elisha said would happen actually happened. The Moabites got up in the morning, and they saw the valley fill of water, but they saw it with a red reflection in it. And they said, That's blood. <laughs> Then those three kings from the Middle East are killing each other from afar. They, they literally, like those guys killed each other last night. Let's go down and get their cattle before they die. And they start to go down there. And lo, those three kings are not dead. And the Moabites are ambushed. And God gives the victory to the three kings, the king of Judah, the king of Israel, and the king of Edom. Look at verse 18. This is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. This is history. This is Israel and Judah's history. This tells us about a time when the spiritual temperature of God's people was cold. About a time when God really wasn't moving and working and, and really the circumstances are nothing to brag about. Israel is divided into two separate kingdoms. They're not really looking for their Messiah. They're, there's idolatry mixed in among them. On top of that, they're working with the Edomites who are heathens. It's just nothing really great about Israel here. Jehoram is the son of some of the worst people that ever lived, and he isn't much better than them. He's not a good guy. He, put, he, he did away with Baal worship. And he acknowledged the Lord when he felt like the Lord was going to kill him. Now here's a question. Was God really going to kill these three kings? I think so. And God said, there's are three lousy guys, and I'm going to let them die of thirst. I make them look like fools coming out to kill the sheep farmers. Think about this. Three kings, these are big-time kings in their day, are coming out to besiege a king of the sheep. They're coming to kill... Sheep farmers. Literally, the Moabites are like, hey, all you farmers, come out of the hills. You know, this isn't a Paul Revere's ride, you know. <laughs> if the, you know, tell the country folk. This is the Moabites, and they're really nothing. And these three kings come out to kill them, and yet it's not the Moabites that are going to kill them. It's famine. Not famine, it's, it's drought. They're, they're literally going to die of thirst. Who arranged that? God did. And the king of Israel, Jehoram, said, you know something? I don't want God to kill me. Anyway, I can talk to him. Jehoshaphat said, yeah, there's a, there's a prophet. Let's go talk to the prophet. And the prophet said, I wouldn't even look at you. I wouldn't even talk to you. I wouldn't face you, and I wouldn't speak to you if Jehoshaphat were here. I don't like you. As far as I'm concerned, you can die of thirst. How would you feel if somebody spoke to you like that? I mean, he came to, it doesn't seem very polite, does it? But Jehoram needed help. It's interesting that sometimes we want God to work in our terms. You know, I think nowadays if you had a preacher that shouted too much, people would walk out of the church house even if he was preaching the Word of God. Because they don't like his manners. We've got far too much. I keep saying this, but it's true. We've got far too much of the it isn't what you said, it's how you said it mentality as Christians. You know, it ought to be more about what's said than how it's said, if it's truth. I'm not saying that the truth shouldn't be packaged in love. I'm not, dis I'm not disagreeing with that. And you know something? If you want to think that, it's because you want to think that. And the shoe fits. 
but we've got to, you better, you better not, you better speak to me in a way that's palatable or I won't listen to you. But we need to be spoken to. You know, if God spoke to us, He might tell us that we aren't worth talking to. He might say, you know, the garbage that's in your house, I shouldn't even answer your prayer. I shouldn't even acknowledge you. You know, the, you know, the way you've been living and the way you've been speaking to me or not speaking to me, I shouldn't even acknowledge your existence. But here we see something in Jehoram that gets a hold of the heartstrings of God Himself. And you know what it is? He acknowledged His need. It's, it's just that simple. There isn't Jehoram coming and saying, you know, I realize that I'm the son of a couple of the most wicked people who have ever lived and I'm coming to you, God, fully repentant. And I've changed my ways. Remember, I put Baal away. Remember that? God, I, you, know, I, you know, you might think I'm a bad guy, but I'm not as bad as you think I am. And I, I'm open. No, Jehoram just comes to God and says, God, I know you're trying to kill me. Please don't kill me. And Elisha says, you know, as far as I'm concerned, God could kill you. Bring me a minstrel. Minstrel comes and plays his banjo for a little bit. Then, God tells Elisha, here's what I want you to do. I want you to dig ditches in the whole valley, and in the morning I want to put water there. It's not going to rain. There's just water's just going to come from Edom. And sure enough, it happens. And the Moabites wake up and they see it and they, it looks red to them. And they're like, oh, they, them guys killed themselves. Let's go get the cattle. <laughs> they're sheep farmers. That's how they think. And they come out to get the cattle and they get ambushed. And Jehoram lives and Jehoshaphat lives and the Edomite lives. And it's not because they deserve to. It's because they acknowledge their need and God responded. Now, friend, I'd like to have revival on better terms than that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Yes? But if you don't even acknowledge what you need, you're worse than that. Actually. You ever think about that? A people that don't think they need revival are worse than these three kings. Hear me now. And you'll get less of God than that. And there's just got to be a starting place in our thinking, doesn't there? You know the starting place in our thinking ought to be? An acknowledging of our need an acknowledging of our need. Because I know something about the character of God in heaven. These guys are scoundrels. As far as I know, Jehoram's in hell today. And the king of Edom, I'm sure he is. He's burning in hell today. They were godless. They were not believers in God. And yet, God listened to them when they acknowledged their need. That's the kind of a God He is. See, what you see here isn't these kings. What you see here is something about the character of God. Do you agree with me tonight? See, what you're seeing here is that there's something about God. That when you acknowledge your need, He responds. I'm glad to say that I'm blood-bought. I'm born again. I'm a child of the King. I have the witness of the Holy Spirit living in me. And God is speaking to me, and I have the Word of God. And I'm not a heathen. I'm all about the church. I'm part of this church. I'm part of Christ's plan. So I don't need anything. Is that so? No. See, a lot of times that's our approach. And we wouldn't say it. But our lack of asking God for something proves that that's what we think. 
You may not say something, but what you do proves it. And if you're not asking God for a revival, you don't think you need it. That's a logical flow of thought, isn't it? I believe that if God would take three ungodly kings who acknowledge their need and do something for them, I believe God would take three of His children or four of His children or one of His children or a hundred of His children who acknowledge their need and do something for them too because that's who He is. He's a God who responds to people who acknowledge their need. God, we're needy. We need revival. And we ask that you'd give it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.